Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, how's it going? Good? Good. Good. Okay. So, uh, by the way, before we start, I made some announcements uh, in the learn uh, regarding the date of the exam and also the uh, project. Uh, so, let's go to course home. Yeah, exam is December 14th, starting at 12.30 p.m. in E5, uh, so in two classrooms. Uh, this is determined by the uh, department. Is it the last exam of the semester? I think this is the last. They put it the last. Okay. And uh, about the projects, yes, uh, I have made it so in Dropbox. In Dropbox, I have put team members and proposals. Step nine is October 20th. So I appreciate it if you form teams of six members almost. Uh, so even with these many members, we'll have 18 teams. And uh, yes, so let the teams be as uniform as possible. And uh, please submit the team members as well as pro short proposals. Proposals will not be graded uh, to Dropbox until October 20th. And then we'll see and check and verify and if needed we'll give you feedback and then you have time until november 29th which is the last day of the course to do the project and submit the a report and codes of course the report will contain the explanation of the project literature review as well as the results and everything and the uh, project can be either theoretical or Practical or both? What? Yes. Yeah, but it, you need to have some kind of uh, novelty or some, some uh, so it can be, the novelty can be in practice, right? And try it uh, to be, uh, so the, the, uh, I'm saying that you need to show that you have done something, right? <laughs> if you just, Bring some code and do nothing over that. Uh, it's not that much suitable for a project. As I said, it doesn't need to be a theoretical project. It can be a pract practical project, but you need to show that you have done something. You have done. Yes. And by the way, the it would be better, not mandatory, it would be better to have a combination of several methods talked about in this course. For example, if you are doing RL, try to insert some materialistic optimization or other algorithms too. Uh, yes. Uh, I prefer that you do it in Python, but if you uh, if you are not familiar with Python, I think it's a good chance for you to get familiar with Python in this course. It will be good for you to find a job. Uh, if I want to be uh, kind to you, I can say no, that's fine. But if I want you to find a job later, then I I should mandate you, maybe. <laughs> if you want to find a job either in software or in uh, especially in data science and machine learning, you have to know Python. But what language do you prefer? Rust? That's a good language too. I have heard of it. Uh, let me think. That's fine. You can try other languages. But uh, I, also it's good that you uh, learn Python. I have put a video about Python in Okay, okay, that's. But at least if you do it in Python, you can use the codes in tutorial sessions as well, right? And that's that's a benefit of doing it in Python. You already have the codes of simple local search in uh, tutorial sessions. Okay. Any other qu question? Yeah. 
basis of the project? Are we just like looking for something for the research or? Yeah, as I said, it can be either theoretical or practical or a combination of both. Assume that you are doing a project and this project can be either for, for example, assuming that you're writing a paper or doing a, a, an industrial project. But I think project uh, means that you, you have a goal and you code for it to reach that goal, right? And this goal can be theoretical, can be practical, can be a combination of both. Depending on your taste, some people lack industry, some people lack academia. So I, as you see, I, I have made it very open for you to choose your team members because you need to find people who have similar tastes. I don't mandate you who to work with, right? You choose based on your tastes. And also the, uh, the I don't, so because some, uh, some props give uh, determined projects to students. I don't like that too. You choose the projects yourself based on your own taste, but it needs to be related to the course materials. And, and if you try to insert several topics in this course to, to do your project, it means that you know also how to do a system design. So that's why I said, I prefer that you have several topics. Then it means that you are doing a kind of system design, right? Make the system. And yeah, the code will have the results as well and also need to analyze the results. Assume that you are in an industry. If you just show the plots or show the results to your manager without any explaining and analysis, the manager will see will say, What the hell is it? Right? The manager, assume the manager doesn't know anything. You need to analyze your plots and, and you get my point. So an analysis of the results is also important. Uh, by the way, for the for the homework assignment, also please for the coding part, show the results, visualize them. You can feel free to use the visualization tools that we gave you in this tutorial session. Yeah. Any other question? No. So as you see, it's a it's a very yeah. open course. Yeah, that you 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 have a lot of freedom to choose. I don't. I try to mandate as less as possible. I don't mandate anything. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. Okay. Any question about the mat course materials so far? Is everything clear? Okay. So uh, now we, we last session we talked about several topics including differential evolution, evolutionary uh, programming as well as genetic programming. Uh, and we ended up uh, by starting taboo search. Let's uh, restart from taboo search again. So taboo search is a meta algorithm which can be used with other materialistic optimization algorithms, such as local search, PSO. So last session, I talked about what meta algorithm means, right? It means that it can be used with other algorithms. Uh, so it, it uses other algorithms, other algorithms as its sub algorithms, right? Uh, and it was proposed in 1986, and then formalized in 1989. So the author proposed the idea in a reference one, but later found out that it's a good idea and uh, published papers named Taboo Search Part 1 and Taboo Search Part 2 in references 2 and 3. Okay. And the idea is simple. It keeps a record of the previously searched candidate solutions Right, so it ke keeps a record, uh, so that the algorithm does not check them again redundantly. If I have already checked some region of the landscape, why am I supposed to check that region again if I have checked it carefully? Right. Uh, so it saves us uh, from redundant searches. And uh, in other words, those already searched candidate solutions are taboo. I think taboo can be written in two ways. 
taboo with double O or with U, they use it with U. They use the spelling with U for the taboo algorithm, taboo search. So those uh, already searched candidate solutions are taboo to be searched again. So we don't search them again, okay? Hence the name taboo search, right? So let's consider this figure in the middle. For example, I'm coming down the hill, coming down the uh, optimization landscape, this side, okay? I reach here, should I go up again? I already have searched there, this path, right? So I, I put these in the in a list or a table named the taboo list or a taboo table. And then whenever I wanna go to the next step, I check that taboo list, whether my solution exists in the taboo list or not. If yes, I don't, I disregard that. I, I search for another uh, region. So I don't go above the hill again, I go to the other path. And I think it's obvious, if we go there, then the global mean probably is here, we'll miss that. But as we are not going to the taboo candidate solutions, we move to the right, and then hopefully we will find the global best, right? We understand it? Okay. So as I said, we have a taboo list, which is a memory of the previous candidate solutions, which we have searched for. So basically we need to uh, save the memory of the previously searched uh, positions, at least in two cases. I have already ta talked to you about this. Can you let me know whether, do you remember what I said? When do we need to save the memory? Of course, if we don't need the memory, saving this is a stupid, stupid, right? Why? Because it's, uh, in complexity theory, we usually want to have less complexity. For example, we don't, we don't have to increase space complexity. We don't have to use memory for nothing, right? We also want to have a small time complexity. We want our algorithm to be fast. So space complexity, time complexity, all of these, some algorithms, especially distributed algorithms, have messages between the servers. So in those cases, we have message complexity as well. So we want all of these to be small, message complexity, time complexity, space complexity, right? Uh, for, for example, the big O notation, we want it to be small. By the way, do you know what big O notation is? Okay, just for those who don't know that, assume this is a function, okay, function. We can have an upper bound on this function or a lower bound on this function or some region around this, right? So we call the upper bound with weak O notation, the lower bound with big omega notation. And what is around it, that's expectation, right? An expectation or expected value, we call it by theta, big theta. So as you see, we can have at least three ways to show complexity. We have other ways too, such as a small O and these things, but the uh, big notations are big O notation, big theta notation, and big omega notation. And big O is the uh, upper bound, big theta is expected, B uh, big omega is the lower bound. And calculation of these are easy. Just give you a rule of thumb, for example, for example, you have something like one to the, over t squared plus one, right? Assume that time or uh, t is a number of iterations so that total, assume the total time of your algorithm is this, one over t squared plus one. What is this big O notation? So you should ignore all of the constants, right? Then the big O notation is one over t squared. So its behavior is like one over two squared, right? And uh, which one is better, one over t is, or one over t squared or one over one O of t? Which one of these is better for us, for example? Can you tell me? Assume t is a number of iterations and I have three algorithms. One of them is 
for, for, uh, for until termination. One of them is one over uh, o big O one over T squared. One of them is big O of, uh, one over T, and the other one is big O of T. In the literature, we call them in the order one over T squared, on the order of one over T, and the, on the order of T. Let's plot them. Let's plot them. So with respect to T, which means that assume the X axis is T. So what do I mean? I'm going in the iterations of the algorithm. Which one is, so O of T is this, right? Linear. One over T, limit T to infinite. It becomes zero. Limit T to zero, it becomes infinite. So it's something like this. You know limit, right? And one over T squared, I believe it's like this. It goes down faster. Right. So of course, one over T squared is better because the algorithm terminates sooner. One, then one over T, then T, right? By the way, if you, I say this for to encourage you to pass an algorithm course if you haven't. So in algorithms, we can say the efficient, we can talk about efficiency of the algorithm in terms of time, space, and these things, right? Message and th these things. So here, for example, it was order of time, right? We can have order of space. How much memory do I have? So we can say how much efficient the algorithm is, and we can say the efficiencies on the order of one over T, for example, the time efficiency. So to be more accurate, according to Professor Mahesh Turpunitara, who is a very good professor here in EC department, uh, I remember I passed algorithm course with him. He said he prefers not to say time complexity for an algorithm. He prefers to say time efficiency. I will tell you why. So we say that the algorithm is time e efficient with all order of, for example, T, right? or space efficient, so space efficiency, time efficiency. To be more accurate, complexity is used for problems, not algorithms. Have you heard of NP algorithms, NP problems, P problems, NP hard problems, have you heard of them? So those are problems. There's a slight difference between problem and algorithm. By the way, I'm saying this in parentheses, right? Of course, it's not related much to materialistic algorithm type of search, but all of these algorithms have some efficiency. That's why I'm saying this in the map parenthesis. So we have, as I said, we have problems and algorithms. Problem is like what? For example, sh finding sh the shortest path in the graph. It's a problem. Algorithm is an algorithm to solve this problem. So we have some problems and some, some uh, algorithms to solve these problems, right? For problems, we have some hardness of the problem. Some problems are harder than the other ones. You understand? Some problems are harder than the other, the other ones. Then for problems, we, we can use complexity. We say this problem has this time complexity. This problem has this space complexity. How much hard is it? How much hard this problem is? Is it P? Is it NP? Is it NP hard? So briefly, let me tell you what P and P and NP hard these are. Do you know these? Do you know? No? So P is short for polynomial. So, so for example, polynomial, what do I mean? For example, O of T, T is linear, right? And linear is a polynomial. What about O T squared? It is polynomial. What about O T cubed? Polynomial. What about O T cubed plus T squared? What is OT cubed plus T squared? Can I simplify it? Yes, I can simplify it to OT squared, T, T cubed. Why? Because T cubed is worse than T squared. So T squared is absorbed into T, T cubed in big O notation because big O notation is upper bound. What about lower bound? Can you tell me what is big omega of T cubed plus T squared? How is it simplified? It becomes B omega of T cubed, T, sorry, squared, because T cubed is absorbed into T squared in terms of lower bound. Do you see that? T, of course, T, T 
cubed goes up like this, but t squared goes like up like this for positive t's, right? So uh, in terms of upper bound, which is big O, it, t squared is absorbed in t cubed. In terms of big lower bound or big omega, t cubed is absorbed in t squared. Did you get it? Okay. So polynomial uh, p uh, problems means that the complexity is polynomial. T, T cubed, T squared, etc. Right. And what is NP? NP is short for... Am I right if I say it's short for non-polynomial time? If you say that, you have solved a million dollar question. There is a problem whose award is a million dollars. <laughs> okay, if you say that NP means non-polynomial, the problem is this. Well, is P equal to NP? P means polynomial. If I say NP is non-polynomial, of course they are not equal to each other. Right. So why do they put $1 million for this question? Because NP is not non-polynomial. It is non-deterministic polynomial time. So what does it mean? It means that do I have, assume I solve, I solve my problem because that was for problem. But I solve my problem somehow, somehow. Can I check whether that solution is correct or not in polynomial time? So whether it's checking, checking the solution is can be done in polynomial time or not, then it, that is NP. Okay. Can you tell me what happens if P equals NP? Assume someone proves that P is what equals NP. We conjecture that P is not equal to NP, okay? P is a subset of NP. But if P is NP, according to just what I said, anyone can be, for example, Mozart. Why? Because P means that I become a Mozart in polynomial time, okay? I definitely become a Mozart, for example, in polynomial time, if I want. NP means I check. I can check whether someone is Mozart or not. I think checking whether someone is Mozart or not is actually polynomial, right? You claim that I'm Mozart. I say, okay, play, make it, write a symphony in one day. All right, Mozart did, could do that. If you can write a symphony for me, a new symphony in one day, or if you can play violin, very well, then I will say that maybe, yes, you're right. You are a Mozart, right? So checking whether you are a Mozart or not is polynomial time. But becoming a Mozart or solving the problem of becoming a Mozart, is it polynomial or not? If I say that P equals NP, it means that everyone in this world can become Mozart in a few days or in a few years. But is it true? Of course not. That's why we conjecture that P is not equal to n. Okay. So I just, in parentheses, I told you this to encourage you to uh, pass an algorithm course. And I believe it's very interesting. If you go to an interview in industry, they will definitely ask you in coding interviews. They will ask you about efficiency. For example, when they ask you to write an algorithm and they will, they will say, what is it? They usually call it complexity. Okay, doesn't matter. Complexity or what is the time complexity or time efficiency of your algorithm? What about its space efficiency or space complexity? Right? Okay. So let's go back to taboo search. Taboo search uses space or memory as a trade off with not checking redundant solutions. Right? So, of course, we use memory, so our space complexity is worse, but we sacrifice that for not checking the redundant solutions, right? This list has a maximum length not to spend too much memory. Of course, if I don't put a cap on the length of the taboo list, what happens? I will have memory error after a while, right? If the length of the taboo list is L, the taboo list contains the last L candidate solutions and does not repeat them. 
right? So I basically record my last L so candidate solutions. Then the L plus one overflows from the taboo list and goes away, right? I forget that. So basically you can see it as what? As a queue. Have you passed any data structure course? It's like a queue. Something is coming up here and some, something falls away from the other side of the memory. Uh, we can have several taboo lists with different lengths, right? Uh, such as short-term memory, medium-term memory, and long-term memory. In human also, we have short-term, long-term memory. So we can have different lengths of the memory. These memories have different lengths. Of course, short-term memory has shorter, right? Long-term memory has longer memory. Based on the qualities of candidate solutions, and or predefined rules, we can have predefined rules. Yes. Because, uh, so the question is, what's the, uh, what's the point of having several lengths of the memory? Because we can use them in for different purposes, not for one purpose. As, as I'm saying here, we can have a predefined, some predefined rules, right? And then we can put any visited candidate solution in one or several of these lists. For example, one of the lists might uh, save the candidate solutions which satisfy some rule that is determined by the user, right? So we, if we have several rules, we can have several lists. That's the reason. These rules are defined by the user and the problem, right? For example, if a candidate solution contains some specific values for some specific features, then I put them in medium term memory, for example. Do you get it? For example, I, I, my problem says that I don't like these kind of solutions whose second feature is between two and 10. Whenever I see that, I put it in the medium term memory and I, it becomes taboo, right? You see? Okay. There is something, some concept in taboo search, and that's aspire, aspiration criteria. Okay. When using taboo search, we can have aspiration criteria, or if it is one aspiration criteria, these are, which are rules which allow a taboo move. So sometimes we allow a taboo move. What do I mean by taboo move? I mean, I, I, I want to go to that candidate solution and that already exists in my taboo list, but according to some criteria, I might accept that and go to that candidate solution again. So searching in on already checked candidate solution to be accepted if it satisfies some condition or conditions, right? For example, a common aspiration criterion is to accept a taboo move if its cost function is the best uh, solution found so far. So I'm going and searching some region of the landscape and I will have some taboo lists, right? Of course, maybe uh, in the last L solutions, one of them was very good, right? Its, its cost was very good. And I inserted that in the taboo list. Then I go to some other region of the landscape I search, but those parts are awful. All of their costs are high. I get disappointed from this region. After some so many iterations, I say, oh, forget it. I go back to my best solution, which I had in my taboos. And I go back there. Hopefully, around that, I find a better solution again. Did really you get it? So basically, what do, do, I, do I mean? For example, consider this surface. Here, I found a good solution and I search the, the, these paths around it, okay? I was coming here, it's going up, okay? So this is already saved in my taboo list, right? I'm going up, this part is awful. After so many iterations, I found out that I get disappointed from that region. I go back to my best found solution and I know that my, my best found solution is in the, a taboo list. It hasn't yet overflowed from that. If it overflows from my 
taboo list, I can accept that it's not taboo anymore. But assume it it uh, has happened in the last L ones, right? So it's in my taboo list. I go back to where, to where it was, but I don't go from that path which yielded to that again. I go to some other direction. So I restart from my best found solution existing in the taboo list, but I continue another path. Did you get it? And I think it's obvious because that was good. So maybe around it is good, but let's not check the redundant solutions around it. Let's go to some other path. And that's called aspiration criterion. So in other words, during optimization, if we do not find good solutions for a while, for some iterations, for so, so many iterations, it means that we have got stuck in some bad regions of the optimization landscape. In these cases, let me finish it. In these cases, we can go and continue searching from one, one of the taboo candidate solution, which had the best sol the solution so far. From that point, we continue the search, but in another direction. Yes. I'm saying that in taboo list, uh, again, it depends on the implementation. You can store the position or the already candidate solutions and their costs. You can do that, okay? And then uh, if uh, you go and find some good solutions, some good candidate solutions, you continue without repeating the taboo list. However, if you go for 1,000 iterations and you don't find a good solution, you should get disappointed from that region, right? Then where do you go? The best thing with, with the most rational thing is that let's go back to where we had the best solution so far and start from another path and go from another uh, path from starting from that candidate solution. Did you get it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can. So it, it depends on you how to implement that. You can store the cost of the, the positions as well in the taboo list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Local search with a history. That, so it depends on uh, when you say local search with a history, what do you use that history for? If you use it as a taboo, it becomes taboo search. Right? You might use your history for visualization or for some other thing. If you use it for taboo not to repeat them, it becomes taboo search. Yes. Okay. This is just another project. Can you give an example of what you Theoretical. Okay, let me finish this slide deck and I will talk about it okay, after the taboo search. Okay, is that fine? Yeah. This, this is a Yes. Yes, yes, it's a meta algorithm. For search, in uh, for finding the candidate solutions, you can use any algorithm. You can use local search, you can use PSO, you can use genetic algorithm, right? But I'll, I, will talk, uh, I will talk about it. Okay, the flow chart. So this is the flow chart of the taboo search meta algorithm. What does it say? It starts from here, then initialize candidate solution randomly or on a grid in the optimization landscape, then calculate the costs or fitnesses and do local search or do any optimization algorithm that you have, such as PSO or genetic algorithm or whatever, and find a good neighbor, find a, find a good solution. Then is the neighbor or the solution that you found in taboo list? If yes, check the aspiration criteria. Does it satisfy the aspiration criteria? If no, search again and find an, another good solution, good candidate solution. If it satisfies the aspiration criterion, then move to that neighbor, accept that neighbor, 
right? Although it was in the taboo list. Also from this side, if it wasn't in the taboo list, we should also accept that and move to that name, right? Then we say, is the found solution better? Is the found better solution? If uh, the solution is better than the best found solution so far, update the best found solution so far, of course, right? Then check the termination criteria. If it satisfies termination criteria, such as the maximum number of iterations, end it and return the best found solution so far. Otherwise, update the table list. So insert that candidate solution in the table list, right? And then go back to search again. So I think it's, it's straightforward, right? Okay. Now let's take a look at its pseudocode. So initialize the candidate solutions, x1 to xn, and the taboo list denoted by top fancy t. Initially, the taboo list is empty, right? Then while not convert or not terminated, by the way, for materialistic optimization, it's better to say not terminated because you don't necessarily convert. Anyway, not while not converged or not terminated, do what? So perform your materialistic optimization such as local search. It gives you some X dagger, right? X cross or X dagger. Then if X belongs to the uh, taboo list, then check the aspiration criteria. If it is satisfied, accept that X dagger as the next X, right? Otherwise, continue the loop and find another one, in another X dagger. Also, if X was not, sorry, this X needs to be X dagger. If the X dagger is not in the taboo list, accept that X dagger as the next solution. Afterwards, check whether F of X, the cost of that X is better than the best cost so far. If yes, update the best cost so far and the best solution so far. Afterwards, check the term, termination criteria. If they are satisfied, terminate the, the loop and the algorithm. Otherwise, update the uh, taboo list by inserting that uh, X in the taboo list. So T union X means that insert X to the uh, list, right? Of course, the list can have a maximum length. And finally, return the best solution found so far. Okay. Acknowledgement. Uh, some slides of this slide deck are inspired by teachings of Professor Said Sharifian at Amir Kabir University of Technology Department of Electrical Engineering in Iran. Some papers and books about taboo search, references four, five, and six. So I put references for you if you want to know more information about these algorithms. So these are the references, right? So this, this was the main paper which proposed the idea of uh, taboo search by Glover. And then Glover uh, pro proposed these formal papers, taboo search part one and part two. Also, he has a tutorial on taboo search in 1990. And he has a book on taboo search published in Springer. Also, we have, a, uh, I believe this is a survey on taboo search published in 2005. Any question? No? Okay, back to your question. So what was your question? Can you repeat that? Depending on which part. So the question is, can for the project of the course, can, we, uh, can I give uh, some examples for the theoretical project? I'm saying that depending on which topic is because we are going to cover hopefully four topics in this course so for example in meta heuristic optimization you you can de uh, design a new materialistic optimization algorithm and you can also insert some mathematics in it right mm -hmm. uh, the more mathematics it has the the cooler it become i believe uh, so uh, there are a lot of materialistic algorithms, I'm covering the core ones, 
you can see, so you know the core ones, you can see some other algorithms. And also I have mentioned some of the main scholars in this area. See, read some of their papers to see the taste of the algorithm. And then you come up with a new algorithm. That's one thing. Uh, another thing, for example, although I believe that I believe that materialistic optimization is easy. So uh, if, if you propose a materialistic optimization algorithm, you shouldn't expect to publish it in a high uh, quality conference or just they will reject you because that's easy. Okay. But you can definitely publish it in some medium level conferences, such as IEEE conferences, right? You can publish them there if it is good enough. And if you compare with different algorithms on different benchmarks and show that it is working well, right? Also, Elsevier journals accept these kind of papers a lot, okay? Even good Elsevier journals. And so that's one way. Another, another topic is game theory. In game theory, all the game theory, again, in games, there are two type, groups of mathematicians. Some mathematicians believe that game theory is a joke. Uh, yes. Some mathematicians strongly believe in game theory. That it depends on which side you want to stand in. <laughs> Even uh, some uh, people in finance, I think we have here, right? Do we have people from finance department, management department? You, you are, right? You are management. Yeah. So we have some students in management too. So they they usually like uh, game theory because it's, it has a lot of uses in finance, in, in duopoly, monopoly, and these things. So a lot of game theory has been developed by people in finance and management. And it's very cool. Even some people who has who have won Nobel Prize in, in finance have done uh, works in game theory. I, I think, I believe several years ago, the, the person who won the Nobel Prize in economics and finance uh, was a game theory person. Uh, but again, you can work on its theory or you can apply it on some problem. Uh, the next topic is the uh, reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning, you can do a lot of theory in it. Uh, and I think it's not that much easy. <laughs> you can see uh, there are thousands, if I don't say millions, of papers in the theory of reinforcement learning. Again, you can have work on fundamental reinforcement learning, which will cover, but you can go further and you can work on multi-agent reinforcement learning, meaning that you have several agents cooperating with each other to do to uh, learn the environment and do as desired. So multi-agent reinforcement learning is a newer version of uh, reinforcement learning, well, in short, M-A-R-L. Uh, one of my friends, Shriram, uh, works on multi-agent reinforcement learning. He's now a postdoc in a Vector. Also, if you want to know a, a, pers a prof here working in multi-agent reinforcement learning, I can refer you to uh, Pascal Poupart. He's in CS department. He's very good in RL. Okay. And uh, the last one is fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic is an old uh, piece of science, but I believe it's very cool. And there are newer variants of fuzzy logic. If I find time, hopefully I will introduce them to you, which even some people who have worked in fuzzy logic haven't heard of. I don't know why. So for example, fuzzy logic, uh, so we will see that, for example, there are some very old but fundamental systems in fuzzy logic such as Mamdani fuzzy logic and usually these names the names in fuzzy logic are J Japanese uh, names because uh, in Japan it developed a lot uh, so such as Mamdani or Tokushima or something like I don't remember the exact name but we will cover them in this course but you can go further for example we have uh, we have complex fuzzy logic what do I mean you have complex numbers right so rather than using real numbers in fuzzy logic, we can use complex numbers in fuzzy logic and that becomes complex. What is a generalization? So in, you know that in uh, 
complex theory in mathematics. A big field is complex numbers. By the way, complex numbers, if you didn't know, it's related to manifolds too. So people even, I know it might not be that much related in the first glance, but people who are in geometry, if you go to the department of mathematics, pure mathematics, a field here, even in you order, a field is geometry. They work on differential geometry and those things. A part of that, some people of that work on complex theory too, because complex theory is related to manifolds, smooth manifolds, Riemannian manifolds. We have complex manifolds as well. Anyway, so you can become very theoretical if you can work on those in the area of fuzzy logic. That's one thing. I, I know that some people in pure math work on fuzzy logic. So, fuzzy logic, so several types of groups work on fuzzy logic. Either control, people in control theory. Do we have here anyone from control theory? Yes, yeah, so, so you, you must have past linear controls, controllers, uh, and uh, uh, also digital controls and these things. One of the uh, things in control is fuzzy controller, right? Fuzzy controller. And also some people in AI work on fuzzy logic. So for example, they have combined fuzzy logic with neural networks. They named it ANFIS. And a third group working, uh, what happened? A third group, a third group on uh, working on fuzzy logic is uh, people in pure mathematics. In pure mathematics, people work on uh, fuzzy logic. Uh, some people work on, especially the people in topology. It's related. Can you believe that? In topology, they work on fuzzy logic too. And also, what is the generalization of complex theory? So in complex, we have A plus I, B, or J, B, right? What if I want to have several I's? I, J, Z, you get, so A plus I, B plus J, C plus Z, D, or K, D. That's called qua quaternion. Quaternion. Quaternion is the generalization of complex numbers to 3D, 4D, okay? Because we know that in fuzzy logic, we have this, right? And this, for example, this becomes one plus J one, right? Or I one. So we can have one plus I one plus J one. What what does it become? It becomes like a cube. So in 3D, right? It's in 2D, right? 2D plane. If we add another axis, then we'll have one plus I one plus J one. If we have another one, then we'll have K one, right? But it's not that much simple. It needs to satisfy some properties of complex theory. So it's not like saying that, okay, let's add one thing. It's hard okay, to add one axis. It needs to satisfy some properties. They call it quaternion. Feel free to look it up in Google and Wikipedia. It's very cool. Okay. Uh, so let's continue. Any question? Yes. Now, is, yeah, I'm saying that to show that you have done something. Show that uh, if you are working on theory, add to the theory of the world, right? If you are working on practice, use it for a practical project, but add to the practical. Don't just copy and paste uh, the others' works. That's what I'm saying. Add a, a value to this world. This is what I mean. It doesn't need to be a high, a, a very a high level paper acceptable to NERIPS or something. Let it be some a small project, but add, it needs to add something. Not a very big claim, small thing is fine. Did you get it? Okay. If you want, you can publish the paper or at least put it on archive if you would like. Right? And I, yeah, you, you feel free to do that if you want. So, but it needs to have some quality, some level of quality. 
Any other question before we continue? No? Okay, let's um, go with the next topic, which is ant colony. Okay, ant colony optimization. So ant colony optimization, or ACO in short, is a family of materialistic optimization algorithms. So it's not one algorithm, it's a family, okay? Which are mostly useful for optimization on graphs. So what is the main idea, the good main idea behind ant colony algorithms? It's usually useful for graphs when you want to optimize over graphs, such as finding shortest path. So ant colony is a swarm optimization. It means that it has several particles or several candidate solutions cooperating with each other. Method, which, and also it's probabilistic, okay? The original ant colony is also named simple ant colony optimization or SACO, S-A-C-O. One of the initial ant colony algorithms is named the ant system, okay? Okay, one of them is ant system, which was proposed in 1992. Okay, in Marco Dorigo, Dorigo's PhD thesis. So one of the initial ant colony algorithms was proposed in a PhD thesis. Another initial ant colony system was by Luca Gambara, Gambardella in 1997 for, for the traveling salesman problem. Traveling salesman problem is also a problem an optimization problem in graphs, right? You can solve it by dynamic programming as well. So what is that? You have a bunch of cities, right? Some, some of them or all of them, depending on the map, are connected to each other with some cost. For example, going from this city to another city might be easier than going from this city to another city. Maybe between two cities, there is a river, then you need a ferry between them. But if there is only streets between the two cities, that's easier. So we have different costs between the cities, right? Then we have a traveling salesman or traveling salesperson who wants to go from all of these cities to sell something, but uh, uh, he or she wants to visit every city only once. First off, he or she wants to visit all cities and every city once and come back to where he or she was, right? So this is called traveling salesman person. And with the least amount of cost. So with the least amount of su summation of the costs. This is called traveling salesman per problem. And so of course we can use uh, ant colony for that, right? Because that's used for optimization on graphs. Two of the important scholars in the area of ant colony algorithms are these Marco Dorigo, who had ant system in his PhD thesis, and Luca Maria Gam Gambardella, uh, who I said has uh, proposed, uh, who has talked about ant colony for traveling salesman problem, right? And you feel free to see their Google Scholar pages and you'll see how many papers they have on ant colony, okay? So consider two paths, path one and two on the ground from point A to point B. Okay, consider two points. Now, assume, so these paths are like this, as you see. I put some, a bunch of ants here in point A. The, the ants want to go to point B. Initially, the initial ants will randomly choose one of the paths, right? After a while, you see some strange behavior that all of the ants will go from only one of the paths. All of them, after a while. So initially it's random, but depending on how many uh, ants choose, uh, so the majority of ants will choose one of them, one of the paths randomly. After that, all of the ants will choose that path without any exception. The reason is something named pheromon. Because ants uh, put behind some material named pheromone on the traversed path. This is their communication 
protocol. So an ant wants to say that this path is good for finding food. So it puts pheromon behind. So the other ants know that this path is a good path, right? And these, this pheromon also evaporates after a while, okay? So the newer the pheromon and the more the pheromon, the stronger the pheromon, okay? And in this way, ants can help each other in navigation. Apparently, I have heard that ants also talk to each other with high frequency speech. We can't hear that. This is what I also have heard. Okay. A graph G is represented by this, V and E. Okay. So now in this slide, I'm talking about graph because it's required for the algorithm. Have you passed any course on graph theory? No? Okay. If, so if you have passed this slide, it's easy for you. So we have a graph G represented by some vertices and edges. V is a set of vertices or nodes, and E is a set of edges or links, right? So between the vertices. So we have some nodes or vertices, and they are connected to each other by some links or edges. There may or may not be an edge or edges between any two vertices, right? If we have an edge between every pair of vertices, all possible edges, that's, that graph is called complete graph or a fully connected graph. Two names for the same thing, complete graph or a fully connected graph. By the way, we have various types of graphs, famous graphs. For example, this is called uh, mesh grid, mesh grid, okay? If you connect these ends to each other too, it's called torus. So torus graph or mesh grid. Mesh grid doesn't have this. Did you get it? And uh, so we have torus mesh grid, we have fully connected. Another one which is very famous is Erdos Renyi graph. Feel free to Google it. So what does it do? Er Who knows Erdos? You know Erdos? Have you heard of Erdos number? No? Erdos one of, was one of the most famous mathematicians in the world after Euler. Do you know Euler? Euler, you know, Euler is very famous, right? After Euler, the most famous mathematician was Erdos. He, uh, he was recent. He was uh, uh, in the previous century and also uh, uh, in the, I think, first years of this century. So he was recent. He used to go to different countries to participate in the conferences of mathematics. And he used to collaborate with various researchers across the world. He had a lot of collaborators. Once, uh, he's, uh, I have heard of a story that once he talked to a researcher from Canada. And, and that researcher said, I'm, I'm from Canada. Erdos had forgotten him uh, and he didn't remind him. And he said, oh, by the way, I, had, I have a paper written by a collaborator from Canada. And he said, that's me. <laughs> he had forgotten his own collaborator because he had, uh, he had had so many collaborators from the vault. Okay, that's one thing. And, because of these many collaborators, we, there was something developed named Erdos number between scientists saying that if Erdos number is one, it means that that person was a co their direct co-author of Erdos. Is Erdos number is two means with, uh, uh, so the uh, authorship distance is two. Is three is authorship distance is three. So I think all people with Erdos number one have died already, I believe. Uh, but may, uh, we have some people with Erdos number two currently. So uh, yes, Erdos is very interesting. We also have Dikestra number, by the way, the people who have collaborated with Dikestra. <laughs> have you heard of Dikestra algorithm for finding shortest path? Whenever you are using Google Map, you are using Dikestra algorithm for finding shortest path. So where were we? Okay. so. I was, oh, what is Erdos Renyi graph? Of course, Renyi was one of the collaborators of Erdos. 
And Erdos, by the way, many of his papers are, on, are about graphs. By the way, do you know how he died? He died in a, co a mathematics conference <laughs> while he was solving a problem. He was solving a, a problem in mathematics and he died in the conference. Uh, so uh, Erdos and Ren, you propose a, a graph named erdos Renyi graph, which is a random graph with some specific probability. You have uh, edges between the vertices. That's called er erdos Renyi. And this graph, it, this probability has some limits if you have some threshold. If you are above that threshold, your graph with, with higher probability is a connected graph. You will not have disconnected parts of the graph, okay? Anyways, let's go back to our main thing, graph. The edges may or may not be directed, okay? The former, which if it is directed, will have directed graph, otherwise it will have undirected graph, right? Okay. The edges of graph may or may not have weights. It can also have weight. If they have weights, the graph is called a weighted graph, right? An unweighted graph can be considered as a special case of weighted graph with equal weights, right? If all of the edges have the same weight, it means that it's like that you don't have any weight. Then a path between two vertices on a graph is a set of edges whereby passing them, we can reach from one vertex to another vertex. Of course, we might have multiple paths between two vertices, right? If the graph is directed, then the path is also directed. And the direction of its edges should be considered. So if it is directed, then the direction of the edges are important. OK? So we talked about graph in short, right? Now, selecting edges for the ants path. So now I'm going to talk about the stages of the ant colony algorithm. First, probability of selecting edges. So as I said, it's a probabilistic algorithm, right? Every edge in the graph has some cost or fitness as its weight. So we have the uh, let's consider a graph, and every edge has some cost or fitness, okay, so as its weight. So we have a weighted graph, okay? And the weights of the graph are either the costs or the fitness, which we want to minimize or maximize. Recall the traveling salesman problem. I said there are costs between the cities, right? So, so something like that. Let's see I, J denote the cost of the edge between vertices I and J, okay? So uh, I, I have two vertices, i and j. It's, there is a weight edge between them, and cij is the cost of that. Every edge in the graph has some ferrament on it, ferrament put by the ants. So by the way, ant colony assumes that you start from one of the vertices as the starting node, and then the, the ants will walk on the graph, OK? So as a result, they put ferrament behind. I think you can guess. What are we going to do with ferraments? We want to put more ferraments on the edges with lower costs, right? OK. So every edge in the graph has some ferrament on it. Let tau i j t, which is greater than or equal to 0, because either we don't have ferrament, which is 0, or we have ferrament, which is positive, right? Tau i j t denote the ferrament on the edge between vertices i and j at the iteration t, OK? For undirected graphs, we have tau i j equals t j tau j i, because the edge between i and j is the same as edge between j and i, if it is undirected. We can initialize the ferraments of all edges to equal amount or to a small positive random values at the start of ACO algorithm. So we initialize the ferraments initially. Why do I don't I initialize them by zero? Because if I do that, the probabilities for X, because I'm going to use them for, prob for probabilities of accepting the edges to move on here. 
if I set them all to zero, then the probabilities become zero, all of them, right? I don't want to do that. Okay. When the kth ant, consider, so because I have several ants, now consider the kth ant, one of them. So k in, in, in the indexes the ants. And the vertex i, okay? Because I have several vertices, consider the vertex i. Kth ant, vertex i. So kth ant is on the vertex i and wants to decide which edge to choose, which is going out of the vertex i, right? The probability that it goes from vertex i to vertex j is calculated as this. So it's denoted by p i j k. K means that kth ant. I j means that I want to go from vertex i to vertex j. I denote it by this. So we calculate this probability as tau i j to the power of alpha at iteration t over the summation of all of the tau i l's where uh, L's are the neighbors of the I. So basically, consider this, this figure, assume here. So assume I have vertices one, two, three, four, five. And here in this example, I assume is two. So my ant is here on this node. So how many options does the ant have? Three edges, right? Going from this direction, this or this. So I have tau one to two, but here I'm assuming it's undirected. Tau one two is equal to what tau two one. So tau one two, tau two three, and tau two four. I have three taus. What should I so the, I want them to behave like probability? What should do we do in this course? We have done it a lot. They need yeah, I divide each of them by sum of all of them, right? So they become between zero and one and they sum to one. So that's exactly what we have done here. We have divided each of them by sum of all of them, right? And this summation is all of, over the neighbors of that vertex i, right? If vertex j is one of the neighbors, of course, this is how we calculate the probability. If it is not one of the neighbors, the probability becomes zero, right? Can I go from vertex to to vertex five suddenly no there is no edge between them right so if it is not in the neighbor then probability is zero so i think it's obvious right which we have several options we make probability for them based on the ferraments on the edges and n i by the way is a set of neighbor vertices for the vertex i alpha which is a power is some scalar hyperparameter chosen by user, right? Therefore, it is only possible to go to neighbor vertices. Of course, it's obvious because I, from node i, I can go only to, my, to the neighbors of node i. Also, if the edge has more ferramen, the more probabilities for the ants to choose that edge for its path. Obviously, right? Because in nature also, as I told you, when an ant sees or senses some, uh, feels some uh, ferment on the ground, it will choose that path with, high, with higher probability. Now I have several paths with several ferments. The path which has more ferment is more probable for the ants to choose, right? Do you get it? Do you follow what I'm saying? Any question? Yeah, ask me. Why, why don't you ask me? Interrupt me. Ask me. Yes. You arrive at that specific node, right? So a path is a set of several edges and nodes, right? So I'm at, uh, if, so I start, every ant starts from uh, uh, the starting node and then goes on the graph. It can choose various paths right from one node to another node how do we choose the uh, which path which edge to choose on my path i choose it in this way for example assume tau two three is very big so probably i choose this one and i go to uh, node three then again node three has two options right if it chooses this then this becomes a path 
uh, I, from two to three, then three to five until it reaches the destination. Because we have a starting node and a destination node. Yes. Sorry, what? Def increase in alpha, what, what is this? So, again, it depends on the amount of tau ij, I believe. If tau ij is between zero and one, increasing alpha will decrease its effect. If tau ij is greater than one, increasing alpha will increase its effect. Do you see that? If you want to exaggerate the amount of the impact of ferrament, you can play around with alpha. Yes. Okay. Any other question? No? Okay. It might be better to add some heuristic information to the formulation of the probability, right? For example, the probability that the ant goes from vertex i to vertex j can be modified to this. So I'm changing that probability to this. By the way, when I'm saying these things, I'm showing you the different variants, each of which has been a paper in the literature, right? So equation two can be used as a probability where I'm having eta ij to the power of beta as well, right? And what is, so beta is also some hyperparameter, which is a scalar. And eta ij can be any value which is heuristic information, whose larger value is more desired, okay? Usually we use a fixed value not dependent on the iteration index, usually. So eta i j t becomes eta i j because it doesn't depend on t usually, such as one over c i j. What was c i j? The cost of h between vertex i and vertex j, right? And of course, I want lower cost. So I want larger one over cost, right? So that's kind, one kind of heuristic. As you see, if I use equation three and equation two together, it means that in addition to considering the ferraments on the edges, I'm also considering the costs for calculating the probabilities, right? This probability as shown in equation two has been used in the ant system algorithm. They named it ant system, proposed in 1996. Reference three, okay. In some applications such as embedded systems, now another variant of P I'm going to. So as I said, this, each of these is a paper. In some applications such as embedded systems, calculation of power, because we have power to the power of alpha to the power of beta, right? Calculation of power is usually hard in embedded systems. Do you remember we had the same thing in simulated annealing. I told you that calculation of that Boltzmann distribution sometimes is hard in embedded system. For example, it is, a, it is an embedded system for NASA. You don't, energy is crucial in NASA rockets, right? So in some applications, energy is crucial and don't want to waste too much energy. So you can change it to, for example, equation four, not to have power. Then I have alpha tau plus one minus alpha eta. Therefore, it's a linear combination between tau and alpha, uh, eta because alpha is between zero and one. And alpha is a hyperparameter again. Did you get it? Of course, the more the alpha, the closer the alpha to one, the more impact ferment has compared to eta. Right? Now, sampling again continuing sampling the edges so so in the previous slides i told you about the probabilities now sampling the edges assume the kth ant is on the vertex i as i said and we calculated the probability pijk for the kth ant for all of the j's which are in the neighbor as the are the neighbor nodes of the ith node right then we can select the next vertex to go by one of the following methods. If we choose them by probability, simple probability, 
What does it mean? It's sampling from the, the discrete probabilities because these, the, these probabilities are discrete, right? Because the number of neighbor nodes is discrete, it's an integer. So I have a bunch of PIJKs. Now I can sample from some value from this discrete uh, distribution. How? We have seen that before. I have a bunch of probabilities. How can I sample from them? Do you remember roulette wheel? Roulette wheel. By the way, if you have seen tutorial sessions, there is a NumPy function for roulette wheel sampling. The TA mentioned that in tutorial session. We have a NumPy function for that. You don't need to implement it yourself. You can, I told you how to implement it, right? Do you remember? put them next to each other, and then generate a uniform random number. Or you can use that NumPy function. So, as I said, this becomes a roulette wheel sampling. Roulette wheel technique. See the lecture of genetic algorithm that we talked, we talked about roulette wheel sampling. Another one, so another way to sample is used in ant colony system proposed in 1992 to 1997, references one and two, is this. By the way, L here is the next vertex we wanna go to, right? Or it's equivalent to which edge we choose. So as in equation six says that, let's see which one is maximum. If, so generate some random number U, if it is, less than r, r is a hyperparameter, okay? r is a hyperparameter between zero and one. And u is a uniform random number between zero and one. If it is less than r, so basically with probability r, only choose the, the edge which has the maximum probability, right? Otherwise, use the roulette wheel sample. Did you get it? Of course, this is the lazy approach. The lazy approach is to accept the, you tell me, the biggest probability, right? Always. The not lazy approach is roulette wheel sampling. We can have both in one method by some probability R. The lazy approach, which is choosing the maximum probability, is it explore, exploration or exploitation? E exploitation because you will get stuck in one path. You will not give chance to other paths. Roulette wheel sampling gives chance to other paths as well. It doesn't choose only the best path. So basically the first row here in this formula is for exploitation. The second row is for exploration. Now you tell me, I'm doing exploitation with probability R here, right? Can I make R adaptive? Yes, because in materialistic algorithms, you usually start with uh, exploration, then we gradually be exploit, right? Therefore, we can, uh, we can decrease, yeah, initially, uh, we can start with larger R or a smaller R, let me think. I think a smaller R, sorry. I will correct it. Smaller R in the initial iterations, and then we increase R gradually, right? In order to increase explo uh, exploitation gradually. We can have other variants, such as maximum probability and random sampling. So, how is it different from, the, so what is the difference between equation six and seven, can you tell me? The second row is different. It's sampling with, with probability one minus R, it's sampling from uniformly from one of the neighbors, uniformly with equal probabilities, right? Equation six uses roulette wheel sampling with probability one minus R, equation seven, samples uniformly with probability one minus R. Again, we can play around with R, gradually change it to have exploration and exploitation. We can have probabilistic sampling and random sampling. I was, so 
we can do this with probability r we do roulette well wheel sampling with probability one minus r we do uniform sampling right what about random sampling we can do we, we can ignore the experiments and do uniform sampling by the way one more thing who no one said that you should stick to one of these from start to the end you can switch initially you can maybe do random sampling and then switch to one or other method after some iterations yes t t oh tilde here tilde means uh, sampling in the statistics so usually we say the variable here and here in the right hand side we see the probability distribution okay t tilde uh, in LaTeX, it's seam, backslash seam. Okay, means sampling. So we talked about how, yes. Yeah, so tilde n, what does that mean? N i means the neighbors of, the neighbor nodes of the ith node. So take one of them. Sample from one of them. We know the neighbors, right? We know the neighbors of the ice node. Yes, so the difference is that sampling from PIJK uses roulette wheel sampling. They're choosing if the edges have different probabilities. Sampling from NI, the edges have equal probabilities. If I have three options, each option has one third probability. If I use sampling from NI, right? And as I said, we can switch between them during the algorithm. And interesting about materialistic optimization is that whenever a new variant comes, it doesn't mean that you should stick to that variant. You can combine the variants, right? And that's interesting. Updating pheromones. Now, so far we talked about how to sample the edges and choose the path for the ant, right? Now let's talk about updating the pheromones. The, when the ant moves across the graph, it puts some pheromone behind. We need to update the pheromones, right? Let's see that. In the real world, the pheromones gradually evaporate. So in this slide, I'm gonna talk about evaporation of pheromones. In the next slides, I will talk about how the ants will impact the pheromones. So they gradually evaporate. Likewise, we decrement or evaporate the pheromones gradually with the iterations to model evaporation of the pheromones. So let's decrement it. How we can say the next, the pheromone of edge between the ij edge at the next iteration is one minus rho times the pheromone on that edge, okay? And rho is between zero and one. Of course, it is decreasing function, right? Because you are multiplying it with some scalar which is between zero and one. If we do not evaporate the pheromones, the ant colony algorithm usually, uh, the ant colony algorithms usually do not converge, especially in the problems with large number of vertices. So in practice, empirically, they have found out, they have seen that if you do, do not evaporate the pheromones, it doesn't work well. It doesn't converge, especially when you have too many nodes. An example of having too many nodes, can you tell me? Social media, Facebook, you have too many nodes, millions of nodes, right? And the edges are the friendship between the people. The whole social media is a graph, right? Okay. Updating pheromones by ants. Now let's talk about how ants impact and update the pheromones. In the real world, pheromones are updated and strengthened by ants moving on them. Recall the first example, which I told you 
about two paths between points A and B. I told you, gradually, only one path, one of the paths is chosen by the ants. Okay. Likewise, we update or strengthen the experiments gradually with the iterations. So, of course, it needs to be strengthened. So, it needs to be an increasing function, right? So, then the ferment of that edge in the next iteration is a ferment of that edge in the previous iteration plus some delta, where this delta is greater than or equal to zero. If the ant hasn't passed on that, the update is zero. Otherwise, the update is, the update is positive, right? And this delta tau t, okay, as you see, it has superscript k. Why? Because every ant has impact on updating. I'm considering the impact of the kth ant, right? So it's a contribution of the kth ant in updating the ferrament for the edge ij, edge between vertices i and j, right? This update is performed for all edges in the path traversed by the kth ant because the kth ant traverses several edges, right? From the starting node to the end node. We update that for all of those edges across the path of the kth ant. And we do it for all of the ants as well, right? So the update delta tau t for the kth ant is greater than or equal to zero. And how do we calculate that? There are several ways to do that. Such as we can consider it as one over fk. What is fk? Is the total cost of the path of the kth ant. Because the kth ant, as I said, traverses several edges, right? Sum up all of the costs of the edges passed by the ant, by the kth ant, it gives you fk. Right? And why do I use one over FK? Can you tell me? Does it make sense? Yes, because what path is desirable? The path with low cost, right? If FK is low, it's good for me, right? So FK is low, one over FK is large. So the update is large. So I update that the fermions of that path more with larger amount. But if that path has a lot of cost, it's good. It's not good. It's very bad. I should avoid that. Therefore, I update its ferrament, but with a small value. Delta tau will be small. So it makes sense. Or I can say delta tau to be 1 over nk. What does it mean? What does it mean? nk is the number of edges which the kth ant has passed. If I use it as one over nk, what does it mean? Of course, I want my ant to traverse a shorter path. If it is a too long path, it's bad for me, right? As a result, if nk is small, it's good for me, one over nk will be large and the ferment will be updated larger, right? It depends on what you want. You want to have lower cost or shorter path. The above equations make sense because the paths with lowest cost should be strengthened and also the shortest paths are usually suitable based on the application and should be strengthened. By the way, you still can use equation 12 and have the desire of shortest path. Why? Because of course, the more the lengthier the path, the more cost it will have usually, right? Do you see the beauty of algorithm? Do you see that? It's very beautiful. It's like you're looking at a portrait by Mona Lisa portrait, right? It's very beautiful. If the edges, if the edges have fitness values, which should be maximized, so, so you don't minimize the cost. You have fitnesses which you want to maximize. Then delta should be F because larger F K is desired in this case. This is fitness rather than cost, right? Now, do, do you remember I talked about evaporation of the ferrament and also I talked about update of ferraments by the ants. 
I can combine them together. It is possible to combine them together as done in equation 15. So let the next experiment of that edge be one minus the rho tau. What was that? This was the equation for evaporation of firm. Plus, let me use that rho again here. Plus rho that uh, delta with delta is positive or greater is greater than or equal to zero, right? So this is the impact strengthening the ferrum by the ant, and this is the evaporation of the ant. I I have a linear combination between them. Why? Because rho here is between zero and one, right? Do you get it? Feel free to interrupt me whenever you have any comments or questions. Maybe you have an idea which you want to share with the class, right? But if it is a too good idea, keep it to yourself and publish it. <laughs> okay. Then update. Then let P, now let's talk about different variants of delta tau. I talked talk to you about two variants already, which were equations 12 and 13, but let's go to other variants. Let PK denotes the set of edges in the path traversed by the kth ant. Every path, ant has, has a path, right? PK denotes the set of edges which is which are in the path of the kth ant. The, there are various variants for updating the ferraments. Some of them are like this. Ant cycle. I have also provided the references. So these three are uh, very famous in ant colony algorithms mentioned in reference one. Ant cycle, ant quantity, and ant density. What are they? So ant cycle says delta tau k at iteration t if ij is in the path, if that edge is in the path, it is gamma over fk. We already saw that. Do you remember? I told you delta can be 1 over f. Okay. We saw it in equation 12, right? Here, it's, this is it's just added some gamma in the denominator, in the numerator. That's it. And of course, for the path edges which are not in the path, we don't have the updates. So basically, this is equation 12 with some gamma in the numerator. And gamma is some hyperparameter some scalar hyperparameter, and it is positive, right? Another one is ant quantity, which says, let's use Cij. What does it mean? What's the difference of equations 16 and 17? Can someone tell me? In the denominator of equation 16, I have Fk, which is the total cost of the path for the kth ant. In the denominator of equation 17, I have Cij. What do I mean? It's just the cost of the edge between vertex i and vertex j. So it basically means that update the fermions of the edges in the path of the kth ant, but update them differently. The edges have different costs, right? Update the edges based on their costs. And of course, the lower the cost, the bigger the update because it's more desirable. Did you get it? Please let me know. Did you get it? Yes? Yes. Sorry. So do you agree that the case ant has several edges passed between the start and end? FK is, the, so I have C, for example, one, two, assume three, four, five. Assume these are the vertices. So I have C1, 2, C2, 3, C3, 4, and C4, 5. What is FK? It is C1, 2, plus C2, 3, plus C3, 4, plus C4, 5. That becomes FK. If I use, if I update all of the edges with equal amount of delta based on FK, this becomes ex equation 16. I'm using the same delta for all of the edges across the path. If I treat them differently based on their costs, then I, I'm using equation 17. Yes.
Can you be louder? Each path has, I can't hear you. Yes, each edge has a cost. Yes, each edge has a cost and the path consists of uh, several edges. What? Okay, you get it? Okay. Any other question? No? The last one is ant density. It just says if I, J, if the edge is in the path, increase it by a fixed amount of gamma, where gamma is a hyperparameter. Okay, it doesn't care about the cost. In practice, we have seen that ant density doesn't work well. I think it's obvious. It doesn't... It, Ignores the cost, right? And the best one is the ant cycle. In practice, we have seen. Okay. Now let's see some variants of ant colony optimization. Already we have seen a lot of variants, but let's see further variants. There are various variants of ant colony optimization. We'll review some of them here. We can update the ferraments of the path traversed by the best ant having least cost. So as you see, we can update the ferraments of all of the ants, or we can say, let's update the ferraments of only the best ant. In, in this iteration, for example, right? Of course, what which one is the best ant? The one whose total cost on the graph is lowest, right? However, this one only has exploitation if we do that. We don't have any exploration, right? And it leads to getting stuck in the local best very soon. Agreed? Ant colony system proposed in 1992 to 1997 in references one and two. What does it do? It uses equation six for edge sampling. What was equation six? Let's go back and see. I don't remember. This was equation six. Do you remember? With some probability R, take the maximum PIG, the edge with maximum probability, with probability one minus R, do the rollet will sample it, right? It uses this equation. For exploitation, it updates the ferraments of the best ant having the least cost in its path, okay? So this update of ferrament, it does it only for the best ant, for exploit for exploitation. Of course, this, this is for exploitation, right? Moreover, it does not ignore updating the other ants in order to have exploration. So it updates the ferraments of other ants by a constant value. So basically, it uses equation 19 for the best ant and equation 20 for other ants. Where in equation 20, this delta is just a fixed value. It's a constant, right? By the way, the first terms are for evaporation. Do you remember? So here, row one and row two, I have row one and row two because I have two formulas. Are the scalar hyperparameters? What is this notation? This is the cardinality of vertices. It's the number of vertices, okay? In the graph, an F star, Sorry, an F star is an estimate of the best or least cost value in the problem. Do you see that? Does it make sense? Does this equation make sense? Whenever you see a formula, think of whether it makes sense or not. Of course, we want lower F star. So as a result, we want the update to be larger if F star is a smaller. So F star needs to be in the denominator. Also, 
uh, the no it scales this with the number of vertices. If I have too many vertices, I shouldn't update them with large value because I need to search further. So I should update them with a smaller value. I shouldn't convert soon. So I put the number of vertices in the denominator as well. Agreed? So V, if V is big, update a sl a slow layer with slow layer. I don't know how to write it slowly, more slowly, <laughs> more slowly. Okay, it is possible to update multiple best ends. We can also update multiple best ends. The first best, second best, right? And not only the top best end using equation nineteen. That's also another variant. There are variants of ant colony system for defining the best ant. Even for defining the best ant, we have variants. So we have best global ant, right? Which one, which ant is the best to use equation 19 for? Either we can say best global ant. I think we had the same situation in PSO, right? Particle swarm optimization. So best is the best ant found so far. Best ant can maybe the ant which have seen the least cost so far from the start of the algorithm. Or we can have best local ant, the best ant in this situation. The best ant can be ant which ha have been have seen the least cost in the current iteration. In the successive iterations, we can also alternate between choosing the best local ant and best global ant as the best ant. That's also another variant. We can alternate between them. Once we take we take care of the global best and once we take care of the local best in this iteration. If we only take care of the global best, we just exploit, we get stuck. What if that global best found so far is a local actually, and we haven't never seen the glo actual global best, right? So we should give chances to the local best in the iteration too. That's why we, we can alternate. You see that? Another variant is max mean ant system proposed in year 2000, not too long ago, right? Reference four. So the pheromones are only in the range tau mean and tau max. So I put a range for the pheromones, hence the name max mean. So I have ma a maximum amount and a minimum amount of pheromones. In the initial iteration, the pheromones of all edges are initialized to tau max. Initially, are, are all of them are tau max. Can you guess what it is going to do? When all of them is tau max, first off, it means that I give every path a chance, right? But why do I put it tau max? Because gradually I want to evaporate them, right? But the ones which are found to be good paths Although they will be evaporated, but also they will be strengthened by the ants. So they will remain, but the other paths will evaporate without getting strengthened. Did you get it? Interesting. So this is to give all paths a chance of being selected. The pheromones of all edges evaporate gradually the pheromones of the best ants get updated. As a result, the pheromones of the edges remain where the best ants have passed from. It alternates between choosing the best local ant and best global ant to have both exploration and, and exploitation as the best. If gradually many of the ants pass from the same path, there is an if in this algorithm. And this if is also important, see? If gradually many of the ants pass from the same path, it means that it updates the best local ant for several iterations. Okay, it says that let's not get stuck in the global best. It, for several iterations, it does the uh, local best. If still many of the ants pass from the same path, it means that it has got stuck. It resets all of the pheromones to tau max and redoes, reperforms the algorithm again. Did you see that? 
Did you understand the idea? So it, when it, whenever it finds out it has a stock, it restarts the algorithm. Yes. You never know, you never know. But here, there was one important sentence after that. It always saves the best solutions. So what it say, it assumes that it has got stuck in the uh, local best. It saves the uh, best solution found so far. It re-performs the algorithm again, hoping to find a better solution. If it doesn't find, you already have the best found solution from previous algorithm. Okay? In materialistic optimization, you never know. You just hope. Okay. Because the cost function is too complicated. Another one is ant taboo. So ant at the end has T. Taboo at the start has T. So they summarize it into ant taboo. Okay. Ant taboo proposed in 1999. Reference 5. So what does it, if an ant goes to some part of the graph, I think it's obvious, what, what is it doing? It's combining the two algorithms, ant colony and taboo search, right? So if an ant goes to some part of the graph, but finds out that the costs are large on the edges of that part of the graph, it can put those edges in a taboo list. Those edges will be taboo, right? not to repeat the path again in the next iterations. Moreover, there is another way to put some edges in the uh, taboo list. So one of them is having too much cost. Can you think of some other bad edges without looking at this slide? So some bad edges are having too much cost, right? We have some other types of bad edges. Can you tell me in a graph? You showed that by your hand. Cycles. When we have cycle or loop, we don't want to go to that loop. Some, some graphs have loops such as this, right? So you go, for example, and you come back to where you were. What's the point of going to that thing? You can bypass the loop, right? Therefore, whenever a loop is detected, you can put the edges of that loop in the taboo list, not to repeat them again. A loop, okay? So we have two types of loop, such as this one or this one. This is also a loop. You go and come back to, from where you were. The taboo list can be either used for that individual ant, again, different variants, we can use that either for that. So if each ant can have a taboo list or we can have a global taboo list for all of the ants. Ant taboo is a combination of the ant colony and taboo search, as I said. It updates the ferraments as in equation 21. So here, this is for evaporation of the taboo, uh, of the ferraments. And this part is for the strengthening uh, the ferraments by ants. But how? So 1 over fk, we already had it because we want lower fk, right? Lower total cost of the path. And also we can scale it by this. f max minus fk over f min. Is if fk or f max is the maximum found cost so far. F min is the minimum found cost so far, right? If Fk is F max, what does it mean? It's awful, right? It's the worst cost found so far. So the update becomes zero because the numerator becomes F max minus F max, which is zero. Obviously, the, that path is awful. Don't update that. Don't strengthen that. If Fk is F min, then the numerator gets large because it becomes f max minus f min. So this scale becomes large as desired. Right? Did you get it? Another one is rank based ant colony proposed in 2005 in reference 8. 
So what does it do? I think by its name is obvious, ranking. And as you see, ideas are repeated. We had rank-based uh, natural selection in genetic algorithm. Right. So if the cost values differ significantly, the same thing that we also talked about, rank-based natural selection in genetic algorithm. If the costs are different significantly, let's use the ranks to give chance to everyone. Does not work well. The, that equation 21 does not work well enough. Therefore, we use rank-based ant colony, which ranks the ants from the best to worst in every iteration, right? Suppose the rank indices for the best to worst are zero to n minus one. So I have n ants, let zero be the best ant and rank n minus one be the worst ant, right? Let the rank of the kth ant be denoted by sigma k. Sigma k is a rank, is an integer. Either zero, zero to n minus one, right? Then the update can be like this in equation 22. The update of pheromon. So this part is for evaporation of the pheromon. What about this part? What does it do? So let's consider the cases, the best and worst cases. So for the best and sigma k is zero. Then this fraction becomes n, n is the number of ants becomes n over fk. By the way, why do I have fk in the denominator? We already talked about it. I want lower fk, right? Lower total cost of that path. Now, consider the numerator. If sigma is zero, it means that it's the best rank, best ant. So the numerator is n, which is the largest. So its update is large. If it's the worst, uh, worst ant, then sigma becomes n minus one. The numerator becomes one, which is a small. So I updated lower. And I think now you understand why I haven't in indexed the ranks one to n because I don't want to ha have, uh, because for the worst ant, I wanted the numerator to become one, okay? And gamma, by the way, we have gamma here too, is a high scalar hyperparameter. They usually put some hyperparameters so you tune to work well. As expected, the best ants have more contribution in updating the pheromones in this mess, right? Let's see the algorithm of ant colony. We talked about it, let's see it in a pseudocode. So ant colony optimization, ACO. Initialize the pheromones I said you can set initialize to random values, but it shouldn't be zero. All of them shouldn't be zero. Why? Because I need to calculate the probabilities. And you, so initialize them to random values between zero and one for all i and j. Initialize t, which is the iteration index. Place all ants at the source vertex. By the way, so in the graph, we have a source vertex and we have a destination vertex, right? Place all of the ants at every iteration. You place all of the ants at the start. Then they move to reach to the destination. Imagine a graph where ants are moving on it. Just need, you need to imagine. While not converged for each ant indexed by K, initially PK is empty. PK was the set of edges traversed by the Kth ant. While not reached to the destination node, select the next edge to traverse by the probability Pij. How do I select that? We already talked about it, various variants. So select the next edge and add that edge to the set Pk. Right? This is union, right? It means that added. Then this is also optional. Optionally, remove the loops from the PK. Uh, equivalently, it means that you have, uh, you can also put it in a taboo list. Calculate the total cost of the path. If that total cost is less than best cost, okay, 
Then update the best cost by FK and also the best solution, the best path by PK, right? Here, by the way, the solution of the, the final solution that you need to return is the path, right? So the best solution is the path. For each edge, for each of the edges, update, so evaporate the ferraments. Okay, at each iteration, the ferraments are evaporated. And as, as I told, if you remove this part, it will not work well, especially for large number of vertices. Then for each ant indexed by K, again, it's a nested loop. For each edge, so for each ant, it has passed several edges in its path, right? Then for each edge in its path, you need to update the ferrumen, strengthen the ferrumen by some delta tau. And what is this delta tau? The different variants, we already talked about it. Then go to the next iteration. And here, I think I need to add one line and saying that place. So this line should be, be, be here. So at every, at the start of every iteration, you need to put all of the ants at the, the starting node. Just a play, this line of place, all ants should be, be, uh, be after the while loop, after the while here, okay? At the end, return the best path as the best solution. Did you get it? Did you get it? Okay. Acknowledgement. Some slides of this slide deck again are inspired by teachings of Professor Said Sharifian at the Amir Kabri University of Technology, Department of Electrical Engineering in Iran, and some surveys on ant colony optimization. Do you see how many surveys? So it's a family of algorithms, right? Different variants. So how many? So at least I found six surveys. There are a lot of surveys. I mentioned six of them. Uh, and these are the references. We have 14 references in this slide deck. Any question? Any question? My surveys. Surveys with literature review. Survey is another name for literature. Any question? No? Yes. Any question? No? Okay. Let's have a break and come back at 845. Okay, guys. Uh, so before we continue, let me briefly mention two things. First up, uh, people have talk, talked about uh, the deadline of the assignment. If many people ask me for extension, at the end, I'll, I may give some slight extension, not too much, okay? But I'll, uh, so do your best until then. And if you need a few more days, I can extend it a bit more, okay? And also some guy, uh, some of you guys said, uh, I think uh, that apparently it's illegal to put the deadline in the uh, reading week. And that's the last day of reading week. Maybe I can move it to the next day of the uh, reading week. Uh, so to be legal. Okay, that's... Uh, but again, uh, I'm open to give, to extend it for a few more days. But just a few more days, okay? And that's what, another thing. Then, did I want to say anything else? I forgot. Yeah. And, and, oh, by the way, one of you guys who asked about game theory, yeah? I believe I, we can finish materialistic optimization today. So maybe next session will be game theory. But you know that next week is reading week. We don't have a class, either lecture class or tutorial session in the next week. So our next lecture session and tutorial session will be uh, in two weeks, right? Right? Okay. So let's continue uh, with where we uh, left off. So we finished, um, we finished ant colony. Now let's continue with gray wolf optimizer. 
So I talked about several algorithms which are have main ideas behind them. Two same other things I want to let you know. One of them is one of the state of the art materialistic optimization algorithms. I think it has been cited by uh, 12,000 times for 12,000 times. It's Gray Wolf Optimizer. So it's one of the very state of the art algorithms. Uh, and it is recently published. Uh, and the other one is Nelder Mid Simplex method, which is used in F min search of MATLAB. Okay, they are both materialistic optimization algorithms. Gray Wolf Optimizer, of course, is a nature inspired swarm optimization algorithm. Okay. So, Gray Wolf Optimizer, by the way, feel free to ask me uh, questions if you uh, don't understand any part. Uh, hopefully, I don't finish sooner. <laughs> I don't know if I can finish sooner um, and I don't have slides, then we, we need to go sooner. Let's see. Uh, so Gray Wolf Optimizer or GWO in short was proposed by Said Ali Mir Jalili et al. Do you remember? I said Said Ali Mir Jalili is one of the most important scholars in nature inspired materialistic optimization algorithm. He is in Australia. He became a full professor directly from his PhD. <laughs> After finishing PhD, he became full professor because of his two many citations. So uh, it was proposed in 2014. Interesting. Uh, this method is highly cited and recognized. If you don't believe me, How many times? 12,966, about 13,000. Basically, what whenever they propose a materialistic algorithm, they cite this paper. So I'd say that Emir Jalili, I think, is this. Okay. What happened to his figure? I don't know why it's not showing his figure. <laughs> OK. So how many citations? 83,000. Of course, he becomes a full professor there. Uh, and so his famous algorithms are Gray Wolf Optimizer, the Whale Optimization Algorithm, Sine Cosine Algorithm, Salt Swarm Algorithm, Moth Flame Algorithm, Harris Hawks Optimization, Ant Lion Optimizer. As you see, many of them are nature inspired algorithms. Okay. Also, he has a brother. His brother is also in, in Canada, in Montreal, uh, who co-authored him in Gray Wolf Optimizer and many other algorithms, okay? So his brother is a PhD student in Montreal. Okay, so Gray Wolf Optimizer, as I said, GWO proposed in 2014, the state of the art, okay? This method is highly cited and recognized. It is a nature-inspired swarm optimization algorithm, right? So it, it has several particles. Here, the candidate solutions are wolves, gray wolves, right? Uh, it is inspired by gray wolves, which are also called canis lupus. Um, it uses, so by the way, this is gray wolf. I think these wolves are mostly found in uh, snowy places. Right? poles, uh, I believe, uh, but they are very dangerous. And, they, uh, and also, so it, as, as I have said, nature inspired algorithms are inspired by some things in the nature. So there are two main aspects of gray wolves that they are inspired by. One of them is hierarchy of grave of grave wolves. The grave gray wolves they live in hierarchy. They have social hierarchy, okay? Although it's not good for humans to have social hierarchy, but they have, okay? So alpha, beta, delta, and omega, okay? So th there are four types of wolves. They live in packs, groups, and they have four uh, levels, levels of uh, dominance, we can say. Uh, we will talk about it more in the next slide. And also they are inspired by the hunting strategy. So they have three steps in their hunting, searching for the prey, encircling the prey, and attacking the prey. 
For more information on gray wolves, feel free to see this website. Okay. It's gray wolves, and this slide talks about their hierarchy. Gray wolves live in groups. The groups are also called packs. Groups or packs of five to 12, okay? And they are members of a social hierarchy. And this social hierarchy can be seen as a pyramid. Why? Because, so the, the top of the uh, pyramid here is the more dominant or the best wolf you can see. And then beta, then delta, then omega. Of course, the best one or the more dominant is uh, uh, the least am amount of it. The least number of wolves are alpha. Then we have more beta wolves. Then we have more delta wolves. The most of the wolves are omega, which are not that much important in this hierarchy, okay? So alpha wolves, what are they? They are leaders, okay? But by the way, how have they found this out? They have seen, observed their lives and see how they are. Scientists have seen. So they are leaders, the most dominant ones. They only are allowed to mate the other ones are not allowed to mate. Not necessarily the strongest, that's interesting. But they are the best managers. The best managers are the alpha, not, they might not be the strongest. Because managing is very important, managing the group for them. Beta wolves submit to alpha wolves, okay? And they help alpha wolves in decision making. Then we have delta wolves. Of course, they submit to alpha and beta wolves. They involve several roles. What are the roles of the delta wolves? The scouts. Am I pronouncing it correctly? I think scouts. So what do they do? They watch the boundaries of the territory. They, care, they are careful that no, no other alien comes to the territory. Also sentinels, they protect and guarantee that the safety of the group, they are like police, right? The police of the group. Elders, they are experienced wolves, which used to be alpha or beta wolves. Now they are old, they become delta wolves. So they respect the younger alpha and beta wolves. Usually for humans, it's the other way around. We respect older people, but for wolves, older people respect the young. Older wolves respect the young wolves. Hunters, they help alpha and beta wolves in hunting. Character case, they take care of weak, sick, and wounded wolves in the group. Okay? The last are the omega wolves. They submit to all other wolves. Last wolves allowed to eat. So first all of the all of other wolves need to eat and then they are allowed. Sometimes they babysit, so in some case. So the baby wolves, which are new, newly born, they take care of them. By the way, you might think that omega wolves are not important. If they die, they die. No, they have seen, scientists have seen that if omega wolves die, it becomes a mess in the group. Why? Because they need someone to be dominant over the other wolves. If you, don't, you remove the weak wolves, there is no one that they become dominant over. So they, and you know that two dominant wolves cannot be dominant over each other, right? So they fight. There must be weak wolves in the group. Okay. Now, how do we use this hierarchy in the gray wolf optimizer algorithm, GWO? In the GWO algorithm, we consider the three best candidate solutions as alpha, beta, and delta wolves. The three best solutions found so far, right? Alpha wolf is the best candidate solution found so far. Beta wolf is the second best candidate solution found so far. And delta wolf is the third best candidate solution found so far. What about omega wolves? All other candidate solutions are omega wolves. 
right? The rest of the candidate solutions are omega holes. Did they get it? As you see, it's a swarm optimization algorithm. We have several wolves. The candidate solutions are wolves. In genetic algorithm, the candidate solutions are chromosomes. In genetic programming, the candidate solutions are trees. In particle swarm optimization, the candidate solutions are particles. Here, the candidate solutions are wolves. Then, now let's talk about their hunting strategy. There is a paper published in Elsevier, reference to, which talks about their hunting strategy. And it says it's an algorithm. The hunting strategy of wolves can be modeled as an algorithm. So it involves three steps. First, they search for the prey. What do they do? They chase, they approach, and then they track, track the prey. Okay. Figure A is showing that. So as you see, they saw a prey, an elephant or mammoth or whatever. Here it is a prey. They found it, they track, they're tracking this prey. Then they encircle the prey. They make a circle around the prey so it doesn't escape. They pursue, they harass, and encircle the prey. Figures B to D. B C and D is showing the process, right? At the end, they attack the prey because they made a circle and then they attack the prey. Figure E, a stationary situation and attack because now the prey can't move because it's encircled and then they attack. You see that? Of course, I think the wolf which is behind attacks first right? because the, the prey can't see it's behind. Now, how can we use this in our algorithm? Okay. The gray wolves encircle around the prey. You remember, right? So we model it mathematically as the following figures. So in two, this is showing in 2D, this is showing in 3D. It means that the, the optimization variable in figure A is 2D, two-dimensional. In figure B is three dimension. So consider this is a prey in the optimization landscape. Okay. And this is a wolf or a candidate solution. What does the in circle encircling mean here? So I'm one of these wolves around it, right? And as you see, if it is if it is X star and Y, so this prey assume it's uh, coordinate is x star and y star so this is and this is x and y i can move this wolf to any of these optional cases to encircle it so what is this distance this distance is x star minus x absolute value right the absolute value of x star minus x what about this distance absolute value of y star minus y Right now, if I say x and y minus, you tell me. So the, what is this coordinate? This is x star minus x and y. What about this? This is x star minus x and y star. Agree? What about this? This is x star minus x and y star minus y. This is two dimensional, right? What about this? This is x star. And y star minus y, this one is x and y star minus y. This one is x and y star. Can I zoom here? No. But I think you get my point. Okay. So based on these two distances, x star minus x and x y star minus y absolute value, I can move around, er, around the prey. Where x star and y star is the coordinate of the prey, right? I can do it in 3D. So I'll have more other options, right? To en encircle around the prey. As you see, I'm ha making a cube or hypercube around the prey. So here, this is a square or a rectangle. This is a cube around the prey. In 4D, it becomes a hypercube. 
You need to imagine it. You can't visualize it. Did you get it? Now let's write it down mathematically as the authors have done in the paper. Please take a careful look at this. So what is it? The gray wolves encircle the, uh, the prey and this is it. So we can say the next X, so I'm gonna update the particle, right? The gray wolves. In swarm optimization, we update the solute, the position of the uh, particles in the swarm, right? Here, I need to update the position of the gray wolf. So xt is my current position. It's d-dimensional, right? It can be d-dimensional. xt plus one is my next position. It's also d-dimensional. I say minus a dot d. What is this notation? This is Hadamard product. What is Hadamard product? Don't worry, nothing very complicated. Element-wise product. I have two vectors. If I multiply them element-wise, the solution is still a vector. Can you tell me what is the difference of element-wise product or Hadamard product and inner product? You know inner product, we talked about it in preliminaries, right? Exactly, this is, so in both of them, we multiply the corresponding elements, but in inner product, we sum them. It becomes a scalar. But in Hadamard product, we don't sum. It, it is still a vector. Or if, it is mat if, if they were matrix, it is still a matrix. Here, they are vectors, therefore it is, the result is also a vector. A and D are two D-dimensional vectors. So this element-wise product is also a D-dimensional vector. But what are A and D? They are defined in equations two and three. Okay. D, this D is a vector which is D-dimensional. Don't confuse the scalar D and the vector D, okay? This is absolute value. I think you know why, because do you remember I said absolute values? Here, the distances, I care about the length, not, right? So I use absolute value. This is xt, my current position. What is this? C, Hadamard product or element-wise product with xp. xp is the position of prey. This position, the position of prey, okay? P stands for prey here. C, Hadamard product xp minus xt absolute value. So this becomes also a d-dimensional vector and this absolute value is applied element-wise. So absolute value of each element, right? And it's a d-dimensional vector. C here is defined in equation four, which we'll talk about. Let's see, let's talk about A first, which appeared in equation one. A is still d-dimensional, but its elements are between minus two and two. This basically means that it's not the whole range of real values. It's d-dimensional, but it, its values are between minus two and two, okay? And in other words, it's between minus b and b. b is defined here, okay? I agree. These formulas are a bit confusing. They were confusing to me too when I, I was right preparing the slides, but this is how it is. This is the algorithm, okay? I'm just explaining them. At the end, you will see that it's basically just formulating this cube, okay? The possibilities around this cube. And it is probabilistic. Of course, I need, I can be any part of this hypercube, right? So this vector A is defined as two, B Hadamard product R1 minus B, okay? And C is also two R2. R1 and R2 are two random vectors, two random vectors, R standing for random, which are between zero and one, and they are D-dimensional. So I have basically R1 and R2 are two D-dimensional vectors whose elements are between zero and one, uniform random values. C is 2R2. As a result, C is also d-dimensional, but between minus 2 and 2, because R is between 
So, give me a second to think. Oh. This I need to double check. It is either between zero and two or minus two and two, okay? But C was two R two, okay? A is two B times R one minus B. And as you see, if R one is between zero and one, let's see the two extreme cases. If R, an element of R is zero, what happens? It becomes two times zero minus B. So it's between minus B. Or if R is one, in another extreme case, 2B times one is 2B minus B becomes B. So basically, A is between B minus B and B, okay? And also, uh, we can see that A is between minus two and two. So, as R, as I said here, consider these two bullet points. As R1 is between zero and one, and B is between zero and two, the range of A is between minus B and B or minus two and two. Here, B is a vector whose elements are initially two, but gradually we decrease it to zero by the iterations of the algorithm. Also, C is two R2, R2 is between zero and one. I think there is a mistake here. It must be between zero, zero and two D dimension. Let's re recap what we said. I know there are too many variables here, but this is their paper, okay? So C is two R2. R2 is a random vector d-dimensional between zero and one. C is two R2. A is two B R1 minus B, where R1 is also a random vector between zero and one. Two B R1 minus B, basically they made it because they wanted A to be between minus B and B, or its elements to be between minus two and two. What are B? What is B? A rank, a, some vector which is initialized, all of its values are initialized by two, but we decrease the elements of B gradually until zero, okay? And D and D is defined as C X P minus X T, so it depends on the position of the prey and x, and also it has c, which was defined in equation four. And at the end, we use both a and d for update of the position in equation one, okay? Here, I have explained a bit for you for to see why it is replicating what we have around the hypercube, around the prey. Let's see. So we had these equations, I'm repeating them. These formulas model all possibility of the hypercube around the prey. So as R1 and R2 are random, I can be on any of the points around the, in the, around the prey in, on the hypercube, okay? I can be any of these. So my, I can be updated to here or here or here or here or here or here or here. For example, in 2D, if we have, assume A is, one and zero as do you remember elements of a were between minus two and two so in 2d a is two dimensional and its elements are between minus two and two in some case might be one and zero right and c also is a two-dimensional vector uh, it is one and one right if we put c as one and one in the in this equation what happens you tell me. C XP becomes XP, right? Becomes XP. Also, I have XT here minus XT. I have absolute value as well. So basically, I will have this because I have two dimensions. XP1 is the first element of XP. XP2 is the second element of XP. X1T is the first element of XT. X2T is the second element of XT. Understood? Now consider A as one and zero in the equation here. What happens? Xt plus one becomes Xt. This is Xt two dimensional Xt, my current position. My, what is AD? A, its first element is one. So it's multiplied by this D, right? 
This is the first element of D times one. The second element of D is multiplied by zero. So it becomes zero, right? Agree? So basically it becomes this element minus this gives me something like this. And the rest is become, this is one of the, one of the points around here. One of these is this vector. Okay. Any questions? I agree. This is confusing, but this is their paper. But we should trust uh, the authors that th this generates one of the points across around the. So the, the if you can generate one random uh, wolf around the prey in another way, do it. Okay. The main idea is that let's move the wolf around the prey to be around to model the encircling. The idea here is important, not how they are doing that, okay? Let's continue. Now in reality, in reality, hunting is mainly performed by alpha, beta, and delta wolves. Do you remember I told you? So, and in our algorithm, alpha, beta, and delta were the first best, the second best, and the third best candidate solutions, right? Do you agree? So here I'm assuming that the prey must be around the alpha, beta, and delta wolves. In reality, it's obvious because they are encircling, they are tracking and encircling the prey. In our, my, my algorithm, it also makes sense because the best solution must be around my three best solutions found so far. Agree? Agree? So I use the formulas that I just talked about three times for the three best wolves, alpha, beta, and delta. Assuming that each of them is a prey, is a location of prey. As I assume that my alpha wolf is on top of the prey, is eating that. Another time, I assume that my beta wolf is on, on, on top of the prey. Another time, I assume that my delta wolf is on, on top of the prey. So XP, basically, in my formulas, becomes X alpha, X beta, and X gamma. Right? And I have D alpha, D beta, D gamma. So I'm using that those formulas three times. Right? So I have C1, C2, and C3 now. My XD is the same. XD is uh, the position of one of the wolves. It can be omega wolf. Right? Also, I'm using this update three times. So basically, I can move my XD toward my alpha wolf, toward my beta wolf, toward my delta wolf. You can see a similarity of this idea with the particle swarm optimization. You see some ideas are shared between algorithms. Okay. So, but I have three vectors, what should I do? What did we do in particle swarm optimization? We added the vectors here, we add the vectors, but we divide by three to have the average. Okay. So basically, I use a linear combination of three updates. As a result, I will end up between the three wolves, assuming that the prey is between the three wolves. Okay. Here is a figure. So here, this is alpha, the position of alpha wolf. Here, this is the position of beta wolf. Here, this is the position of de delta wolf. In algorithm, it means that these are the three best. I hope that my global best is around them, right? So the prey or the global best, the prey here is the global best, is must be around them. So somewhere between them. How do I find this? As an average of these three vectors. These were the vectors that the three vectors that I took average of. It will end up somewhere here. But why do I have a radius here? Because of those random values. I can end up with any range here. Do you see that? Do you see that? Okay. And by the way, for these also I have A, do you see? Also C. 
some range. So I'm using all of these in my, my updates. And I, this, what is this? This can be any word, any particle, including the omega. For example, if it, this one is alpha wolf, this vector for alpha wolf becomes zero. So it only takes care of, uses the vectors toward beta and delta, right? Beta wolf only uses the vectors to, because the, the vector to itself becomes zero, right? The beta wolf uses the vector toward alpha and delta. Delta uses the vector toward alpha and beta. The omega ones use the three vectors. Agree? This idea is very similar to the idea of, oh, it's finished. The time is finished. Okay. Is it finished, really? May I finish this a bit? Or is it? No, is that, let me finish this. I will talk about Nelder meets simplex algorithm at the start of the next session. Sorry about that. So then, so what, this is what we had, right? Xt plus one. Recall that the range of A was between minus two and two. Now in this slide, I'm gonna talk how Gray Wolf Optimizer does exploitation and exploration, okay? So, as I said, A is, its elements are between minus two and two, right? If they are between minus one and one, the gray wolf moves toward the, the, the circle, toward the prey, goes inside, because, because of this equation, goes inside the circle. If its elements are greater than one or less than minus one, so basically their absolute value is between one and two, right? Then I move away from the circle, right? So I don't necessarily go inside the circle. Sometimes my wolves go outside of the circle. Why? If they go inside the circle, it's exploitation. If they move outside, it means that don't care about what prey they have found. Go and explore other regions of the landscape. And of course, why do we decrease initialize B with two and decrease it to zero? When it is two, I go outside initial because initial I want to explore. This is the rule of thumb in all of the heuristic optimization algorithms. Initially they explore, gradually we explore. So we decrease B, so gradually A becomes less than one, gradually after some iterations. And then I will exploit only. This is the algorithm initialize the candidate solutions or the wolves x1 to xn initialize the a b and c values while not terminated calculate the cost values at the candidate solutions the three best solutions found so far will be x alpha x beta x delta as the best three wolves for each candidate solution xi for each of them Calculate the three vectors that I talked to you toward the alpha and beta and gamma. Sorry, alpha, beta, and delta. Then take the average of the three vectors. Then the then update that wolf to that according to that, right? Then update A, B, and C again in this iteration. For example, we decrease B, decrement B, right? And then we go to the next iteration. We do it iteratively. Initially, we explore. Gradually we exploit. And you have no idea how well it works. It has been used in industry a lot. No, no, wonder, no wonder why it has been cited a lot. If you see their paper, they have implemented its optimization on real world optimization. Such as, it, go and see, they have mechanical examples there. How to optimize a spring. Okay, for mechanical people here. You can take use this for your industry as well. Otherwise, it wouldn't be published. So usually, they test it on benchmarks as well as real-world applications. For your projects, if you are designing a new algorithm, you can try them on real-world examples too. A scholar in this area is Said Ali Mir Jalili at Torrens University, Australia. It is his Google Scholar. We, we have videos by Said Ali Mir Jalili about Gray Wolf Optimizer, take a look at this. In YouTube also he has. 
codes of great gray wolf optimizer has been implemented in python matlab java r c c++ and ruby all of them because this is an important algorithm more nature inspired metaheuristic optimization algorithms by said alimir generally take a look at his website also some some of some of works of his, some examples of his works whale optimization algorithm ants lion optimizer moth flame optimizer dragonfly optimizer grass grasshopper optimi optimization algorithm grasshopper have you seen those salt swarm algorithm so from grasses until the uh, oceans. So a recent survey of nature inspired app algorithms has been recently published in 2023. And one of my initial papers was Pontagomerus Mauticus Swarm Optimization PMSO, which was a nature inspired algorithm. And these are the references. Any question? No, thank you. So the uh, next session at the start will talk about the last metaheuristic algorithm which we want to talk about and that's the Nelder mid simplex algorithm using f min search of matlab and then we'll continue with game theory okay thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.